that we are weak, we are foolish, we are not wise, we are not of noble birth, we are sinners, but yet God called people like us and God wants to use people like us to shame the, the wise, shame the strong, so that no one can boast before Him. So that if God can use the weak and the worthless people like us, His name alone will be glorified. Shalom ladies, I'm so glad to see you again on Lesson 12 today. Uh, we're continuing the teaching of Jesus Christ called Sermon on the Mount on Matthew 5. Uh, in the last lesson, we already uh, studied Matthew 5, verse 1 until 12. And today, in Lesson 12, we will continue from verse 13 until verse 24. Before we begin, let us pray first. Father, we thank you, Lord, for um, continuing to be faithful in our life, Father, continuing to invite us uh, to be in a personal relationship with you. And as we study, Lord, the teaching of Jesus Christ, help us, Lord, not to only gain uh, knowledge and gain information, but through this study, we are um, committed to obey wholeheartedly, Lord, of what you want us to do and not out of duty not because we are forced but because of the heart that is uh, so uh, thankful we are grateful for your grace that is saving us and out of that gratitude out of that love for you Lord that we want to obey you wholeheartedly and I just pray that the Holy Spirit Lord will be leading us uh, today in Jesus name we pray amen um, Matthew 5, verse 13, 20 to 24, it's a lot of Bible verses. And to help us uh, kind of like understand better, so I divided this Bible uh, uh, verses into three parts. The first one, part one, is from Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16, it's about salt and light. Part two, Matthew 5, 17 to 20, it's about righteousness. And part three, Matthew 5, 21 to 24 it's about reconciliation and let us begin with part 1 verse 13 to 16 let me read it you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot you are the light of the world a town built on a hill cannot be hidden Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on, on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Um, before I explain what is the meaning of being the salt and light of the world, I just want to highlight verse 16 when Jesus said that so that they may see your good deeds they meaning that the people around us the people in the in this world people that uh, is in our sphere of influence that uh, because they see our good deeds that they will glorify the Father in heaven so many people do good things in this world, right? They change the world, they change, make changes in the lives of the poor people. Um, they do something uh, to change the social injustice, so many good deeds. But what we are talking about here is that when we do good deeds in the name of Jesus Christ, we are not talking about doing good deeds in other, uh, per for other purposes and, and for other uh, reasoning, but we are talking about expanding uh, the kingdom of God. We are doing good deeds in the name of Jesus Christ. So let's go through the, uh, the salt part. Jesus said that you are the salt of the world. Uh, if we see salt, it is very fine, right? It is not very obvious. And if we see light, light is uh, very obvious because the function of light is to remove darkness. So the function of the salt that we need to apply salt in the food 
and it has so many function for salt for antiseptic for a preser uh, as a preservative and if we eat this uh, food or soup without salt it will taste very bland it's, it's not good at all and the same thing that salt may represent our influences in the lives of people around us influence is invisible but powerful people people can benefit from it although they cannot directly see it so this is how we can become the salt of the world by influencing the people around us and i just want to read the quote from kay daigle she said that the great commission do you remember what is the great commission it is the calling to make disciples of all nations and teaching them to obey jesus's commands um, it's on from matthew 28 verse 18 to 20. the great commission calls each of us into spiritual leadership you and i are accountable we are the only christian who influence specific people we can either ignore our responsibility or we can intentionally turn our influence into spiritual leadership. Every Christ follower is his ambassador to the world and a model and teacher for believers who are younger in faith. How are we living uh, in, in this world to the people around us? Do they kind of like experience and benefit our influences in a good way that they know that oh this person is so different because this uh, these people are following Jesus Christ are we touching lives in such a way that they know that we are doing this because we are followers of Jesus Christ and we are glory glorifying the name of the Father um, and we are called each one of us is called to influence the people around us for example if you're working at a company um, you have a certain people your your bosses your colleagues your subordinates uh, these are the people that within your sphere of influence I cannot suddenly go to your office and influence those people because I don't have the relationship and that is not my natural habitat right um, if you are a mother at home that your your children uh, your husband your mates your driver and your friends these are the people that you can influence i cannot influence them because they are not in my natural habitat so god has placed us in a place uh, in a um, environment with people that we can influence in such a way that they know that we are followers of jesus christ and they are attracted to the gospel because the good deeds that we did to them and Jesus also mentioned that we are called to be the light of the world, right? We are called to bring light into this dark world, into dark hearts and to miserable lives around us. It doesn't mean that we have to be big. Wow, it's like a big being, a big shot, being famous in order to become the light of the world. It's not that. Even when we minister to one person quietly, one person who is afraid, who, are, uh, who is anxious who is depressed and nobody's there to help that person and we come to help that we are being the light in the life of this one person and it is count because one soul is so precious in God's eyes and it also can be sometimes our faithfulness our character our integrity um, that we that we display over time that people recognize us as people who are honest who maintain integrity because we are followers of Jesus Christ. In the last lesson, I mentioned about Hendra, my husband, doing his business very clean. Uh, he refused to bribe, he refused to cheat. And over time, after 30 years, people in the city knows that if you want to uh, work together with company that is clean, you work together with Signet. But if you want to play dirty, you want to go to governments, don't go with Signet because they will not uh, bribe they will not cheat so over time our faithfulness and our character our trademark as the followers of Jesus Christ will show and will, it, it, over time it will shine uh, like the the city and the the light of the city and probably you you will you feel right now wow I cannot be the salt and I cannot be 
uh, the light of the world. I myself are still struggling. I am not worthy. I am not talented. How can I be the salt and the light of the world? I cannot. And I want to encourage you from 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 to 29. Let me read it. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before Him. Isn't this uh, verses is so true that we are weak, we are foolish, we are not wise, we are not of noble birth. We are sinners, but yet God called people like us and God wants to use people like us to shame the, the wise, shame the strong so that no one can boast before Him. So that if God can use the weak and the worthless people like us, His name alone will be glorified in our life. So don't be discouraged. God is using ordinary uh, men and women who are willing to obey Him. And the first principle uh, for this part one that I would like to share is that God wants us to become salt and light in this world for His kingdom's glory. Let's move to part two, verse 17 to 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. If you read this passage, why do you think Jesus says this, that do not think that I have come to abolish the law, right? Uh, the law of Moses uh, and the prophets is the minor and, and major prophets in the Old Testament. So the, the law and prophets means Old Testament. If the, there is a possibility that the teachers of the law, that the Pharisees uh, were accusing Jesus of not honoring the law. Uh, for example, the Sabbath day. Remember when Jesus' disciples were hungry on the Sabbath day, they, they uh, plucked the grain and they ate it and Jesus didn't, uh, didn't uh, rebuke them. And also on Sabbath day, Jesus healed the sick in the temple and in front of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees become very angry and accuse Jesus of not honoring Sabbath law. It could be that is the situation there. And that, that is why Matthew, uh, the disciple of Jesus, wrote, wrote everything. This is for the Jewish. The book of Matthew is written for the Jewish people that recording what Jesus said to prove that, hey, Jesus, Jesus said that He come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And if the law says here that Jesus said, you have to surpass even the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in order to enter the kingdom of God. At that time, the Pharisees and teachers of the law are so righteous. They are so self-disciplined in fulfilling the law nobody can surpass them. They are the pinnacle of righteousness and the role model of uh, religious leaders that nobody can surpass them. So what does this Jesus mean in verse 20? Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? The answer is in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. This is Apostle Paul saying, For our sake, He made Him, He, meaning God the Father, made Him, Him is Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, 
so that in Him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. That because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that His righteousness is imputed in us. And this is called justification. I know this is a big word, but uh, this is just a short theology lesson. Justification means that to make justify, right? Let me give an ex example. Let's say you're caught, you're murdering someone and you are in the, in the court that you are about to sentence to be put in prison um, for the rest of your life. And then uh, there is someone who take away the punishment that you are set free, that the judge said that you are innocent. You are justified. You are innocent. You are not guilty, although you are you actually murder. But because of this person, Jesus Christ, that is taking away that is that punishment, that going to jail on our behalf. But in this, uh, in the history, he died on the cross to take away the punishment that that is intended for us, because of what he has done, that we are justified. Although we are sinners, we are murder that in God's eyes, we are righteous. Why? It's not because that we are righteous, but because Christ's righteousness is given to us, imputed to us. And that's why we are called righteous and we are righteous in God's eyes. This is called justification. And also in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 18, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It is anyone is in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, that means the Holy Spirit is living in us. We are experiencing born again our dead spirits made alive because of the ministry of the holy spirit when the holy spirit is living in us there is power that is coming out from the inside to live righteously and even beyond the righteousness of the pharisees and teachers of the law that so righteousness means that two things right first is that what jesus has done on the cross his righteousness is imputed to us, given to us as our status. So our status, we are considered righteous before God's eyes. And second meaning is that because the Holy Spirit is living in us, we are being empowered and able to live a righteous life um, because of the power that is living within us. And if we see the Pharisees and teachers of the law, right? Uh, since uh, the Pharisees and teachers of religious law rejected Jesus. They would never receive the forgiveness of their sins. They were deceived by their own self-righteous attitude, thinking that if they just obey the law on the outside, then they would be saved. Of course, when we are saved, when we are born again, uh, we are, our sins are being forgiven, we are more righteous than the teachers of the law because for them um, obeying the law and fulfilling um, the law with their self-righteousness where there's with their self-sufficiency they think that they get they can enter into the kingdom of heaven through that but no uh -uh. it cannot be done that way it is only by Christ's righteousness alone so the principle for this part two that I would like to share is that only through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live a righteous life that is pleasing to God. And let's move to part three. The last part is from uh, Matthew 5, verse 21 to 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Wow. Jesus kind of like making the, uh, the righteousness even higher, right? In the law, it says, do not murder. 
But Jesus said, not only murder, when you are angry with your brothers or sisters, if you say raka, raka means um, um, wordless, right? If you just say hurtful things, uh, if you uh, harbor bitterness and anger and hatred in your heart, it's already considered murder. Although physically you have not murdered that person. So Jesus is once again um, saying that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they're, they're a portrait of this, right? They're, in their hearts, they're, uh, they're jealous, they're angry, they hate Jesus, they want to kill Jesus. Although in physically, they, they don't kill Jesus. But in their life, they, they, they obey the law, they're, they seem to be righteous on the outside, but on the inside is like a whitewashed tomb. There, there's so many sin inside their hearts. And this is usually the progression of murder, right? Uh, we get hurt, and then after we get hurt, and then we get angry inside, right? Before uh, murder happened, and then uh, we harbor unforgiveness, and then uh, move to bitterness, and then we harbor hatred until, on and on, until uh, someone can m commit murder. It's not just happening um, instantaneously, it, it usually is a progress from uh, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, hatred, and committing murder. And that's why Jesus said that even though it is only in the heart, it is on, already considered uh, murder. And let's continue. Uh, still in part 3, this is verse 23 and 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, lift your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Verse 23 says that if you're offering your gift at the altar, because at that time, the context is that uh, there's still temple worship. But in today's context, for us as followers of Jesus Christ, offering your altar at a gift, it's not literal anymore. It means today it is our personal relationship with, uh, with God. That um, if we are worshiping God, if we are doing quiet time, if we are um, uh, singing a song and worshiping Him, or whatever that we do in worship, that if we remember that we still have someone that is against us or we against someone that this jesus encouraging us to reconcile first and this matthew 5 23 24 is very specifically different from other verses that is encouraging us to initiate the reconciliation that we should be the one that initiate which we, we are the one that should approach the other person to reconcile um, Sometimes we, we, we feel that, well, if I am the one that is wrong, okay, I'm the one that uh, humbling myself, I will come and I will apologize and reconcile. But if it is not my fault, why should I be the one that go and initiate? That person should be the one. But in this verse is that if you know even someone has something against us, we are commanded to go to take the first initiative to reconcile, to go, to humble ourselves, probably to apologize first and to mend the relationship. And um, next week in lesson um, 13, we will talk specifically about forgiveness. But in this um, verse 23, 24, I just want to emphasize that um, the teaching of Jesus Christ is that we are the one as his follower called to first initiate and Matthew 6 verse 15 says that this is the, the Lord's prayer Jesus said but if you do not forgive others their sin your father will not forgive your sins this is the principle that we all need to know unless we forgive other people's sin God will not forgive us right that is that is so scary right when we harbor unforgiveness um, we should know that God will not forgive us unless we forgive others. So the principle for part three um, is that our relationship with God is directly affected by our relationship with others. 
So if our relationship with others are not good, it will affect also our vertical relationship with God. And I just want to summarize the three principles right, that we already uh, discussed from verse 13 until 24. The first one is that God wants us to become salt and light in this world for His kingdom's glory. The second principle, only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can live a righteous life that is pleasing to God. That is from Matthew 5, 17 to 20. And the third one is that our relationship with God is directly affected by our relationship with others. That's from Matthew 5, verse 21 to 24. Now, how do we apply that in our life? Remember that we study the Bible, we study God's Word, not for intellectual knowledge, not just for us to know, right? Uh, we need to apply it. We need to uh, wholeheartedly obey. And I would like to just ask you this question, the three questions based on the three principles. In what way have you been the salt and light of the world? Have you been salt and light in the world, in this world, to your people uh, around you? The second one, in what way you have been living a life uh, pleasing to God? Right? Um, are you depending on the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit to live a righteous life before God? Or are you still depending on your own strength? And that's why you keep failing. You are not walking by the Spirit. You are not led by the Spirit. And that's why uh, your life is, is full of defeat, defeats instead of overcoming and instead of claiming victory after victory because we are allowing the Spirit to empower us. And the third one is that is there anyone you need to reconcile with? Is there any people in your life uh, that God wants you to reconcile, that God wants you to approach and to forgive and to uh, make amends? And I hope you can uh, discuss this with the ladies in your group and you can um, benefit from this study. And let me pray for all of us. Father, we thank you for, again, the teaching of Jesus Christ, the Sermon on the Mount. And we ask, Father, that it is easy to, look, to read, it is easy to learn, but it is very difficult for us to obey wholeheartedly, that our sinful nature is still war uh, inside us, Lord, between we want to obey, we want to do right, but we cannot do right. And we, what we supposed to do, we didn't do what we did not supposed to do, that we, we do that. Father, we ask that you will help us, Lord, with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, that you will help us to do right and to obey wholeheartedly. And because of our obedience, that our life continue to be transformed, we continue to grow to love you, and we will bear fruits for your kingdom purpose. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, ladies. I hope this uh, study today uh, from Matthew 5 will be beneficial for you. And uh, I pray that you will have a blessed week and I will see you again next week.